welcome everybody. It is so wonderful to have you join us. I know there are still some folks jumping on, but we wanted to get started. We have an incredible panel lined up for you this evening, and we want to make sure we have as much time for them as possible. I want to begin not just words of with words of gratitude to all of you for making time in your busy schedules to join us for this important conversation, but I want to thank our sponsors this evening, Bill and Adina Frank. Thank you for your generous support of this seminar. I want to thank our partners at the uh, AJC. It's been incredible to work with you. This is uh, now our second series uh, over the last few months around issues of Jews, race, anti-Semitism, and we're looking forward to our continued partnership, your leadership, um, just how minchy you all are and how nice it is to work with you is, is just wonderful. And one of the great things about our Los Angeles Jewish community is we have so many members who are part of these various organizations. And I want to acknowledge this evening um, the board president at the AJC, Mark Graboff, who's also a, a devoted member of our congregation. And his wife, Debbie, has been on our board of directors for many years. So we're really grateful to you, Mark, for your leadership, uh, both at AJC and your participation at the congregation. Before I turn things over uh, to Rick Hershout, of uh, AJC, I just wanted to say one word about this week's Torah portion and acknowledge a milestone that we're approaching right now. Uh, this week's Torah portion is a double parasha, Vayakel, Pekude, it's the end of the book of Exodus, but just that beginning word of the parasha, Vayakel Moshe, Moses brings the community together. You might be familiar with the Hebrew word kihila, and here it is, in, a, uh, in the verb form, vayakel, to cause people to come together as community. And certainly long before the pandemic, and we're approaching one year since for our congregation, we started having our services uh, online and we weren't able to gather as we were used to gathering. I know that's similar at many synagogues and uh, day schools, JCCs, and other institutions uh, around the country, and of course, much more broader than just the Jewish community. Um, but we found ways to bring people together, vayakel, to people, to bring people uh, together in community, in kihila. And uh, and again, I'm grateful to our partners at uh, AJC for helping us do that as part of this series. And when we think about the ethnic studies curriculum, we're going to learn uh, so much more this evening about uh, what's happening in these important conversations. Around, uh, around ethnicity, around race, around anti-Semitism. But when we think about what it is to bring people together in community, it's one of the challenges of bringing people together in community is how do we listen to each other's stories? How do we honor each other's stories? How do we advocate for our own story in a way that is both uh, necessary and, uh, and, and also um, uh, you know, should, be, should be embraced um, and, and uplifted. How do we do all of those things? It's not so simple, but it's worth the effort. And uh, in some ways, it's the price of being part of this extraordinarily diverse and beautiful community that we find ourselves in here in Los Angeles, but of course, more broadly uh, in, in the United States and more broadly in, in this world. So I'm grateful again to all of you. Rick, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Uh, thank you for your leadership and thank you for allowing us to be your partner in this program. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much, Yoshi, for those beautiful words and that very warm welcome. If there is such a thing as a Menschlichkeit Mutual Admiration Society, AJC and Stephen Wise are inextricably linked and connected in that partnership. It has been an absolute pleasure uh, to take this journey with you and with Rabbi Stern and the entire Wise family. So we are delighted to, uh, to kick off part two of the ethnic studies uh, journey uh, this evening. Last week's session, which uh, many of our participants this evening had a chance to, uh, to be part of, was very uplifting and very encouraging. In many respects, a yardstick of the progress that has been made and the distance traveled on this particular journey, both legislatively and with respect to the important fundamental coalitions that we must build and work to nurture here in California. 
Yet as we near a looming March 18th consideration of the curriculum of the third, ultimately fourth uh, version of the curriculum by the State Board of Education, many questions and many concern concerns still remain about both content and process. So tonight we will delve deeply and examine these issues and contemplate our path forward. We are so grateful to the audience for joining with us. We encourage you to put your questions in the, in the question box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please feel free to do that in real time as the, as the, uh, as the moment uh, takes you. And let me, without any further ado, introduce our distinguished panelists. Soon to be former assembly member, Sydney, Sydney Kamlager Dove, who tomorrow will be sworn in as, as California's next uh, state senator, was born and raised in Chicago, moved to LA to attend the University of Southern California, where she earned a bachelor's degree in political science and joined the Zeta Phi Beta sorority. She earned her master's degree in arts management and public policy from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. In 2020, just last year, Senator-elect Kamlager passed AB 1950, the most transformative probation reform legislation in the country. The bill set maximum terms of two years for felony offenses and one year for misdemeanor offenses, changing what had been a very repressive decades long uh, penal code here in California. As chair of the Select Committee on Incarcerated Women, Tom Lager is focused on reviewing and reforming policies to support the health, dignity, and rehabilitation of women in prison. She also sits on the, has sat on the Assembly Public Safety Committee and Speaker Rendon's Select Committee on Police Reform. She is with us tonight because Senator-elect Kamlager also is committed to advocating for envio environmental justice, funding for the arts, and equity in our education system. Bear those last words in mind, equity in our educational system. We're delighted to welcome you, Senator-elect Kamlager. Nick Thank Melvoin you. is proud to serve the dynamic communities of District 4 of the Los Angeles Unified School District Board of Education. Born and raised on LA's west side, Nick's election to the board in May of 2017 follows a career fighting for our city's school children as a teacher and an advocate. He believes that together with the right leadership, we can ensure that every student in Los Angeles has the opportunity to succeed. As an LA USD school board member, Nick is focused on putting students and families at the center of district decision making by increasing parent and community engagement, making the district more transparent and accountable, directing more resources to schools, protecting our most vulnerable students, and bringing a new spirit of partnership and collaboration to LA Unified. Nick began his career as an English teacher at Markham Middle School and LAUSD campus in Watts, where he also coached soccer and baseball and helped the students launch a school newspaper. Nick holds a BA from Harvard University, a master's in urban education from LMU, and a law degree from NYU, where he was a Root Tildren Kern public service scholar. Welcome, Nick, and thank you for joining us. And finally, Dr. Anita Friedman has a distinguished record of public service, both as a professional and as a volunteer leader. Her roles in the Jewish and general communities extend from the Bay Area to the national and international arenas. Professionally, Dr. Friedman heads Jewish Family and Children's Services in the San Francisco Bay Area, one of the largest and oldest family service institutions in the United States. JFCS programs are internationally distinguished for their excellence, innovation, and compassion. Dr. Friedman has served on various local, state, national, and international commissions, 
including as a longtime commissioner of the San Francisco Human Services Commission, overseeing the city and county of San Francisco's social welfare budget. She also currently serves as a commissioner on the State Board of Education Instructional Quality Commission. Welcome, Dr. Friedman. So here we are. This is a fast moving and evolving dynamic when it comes to ethnic studies. And while we are two years in, even the headlines since our last forum one week ago have raised eyebrows and caused great conversation and in some quarters consternation here in California and across the country. The LA Times editorial board last Sunday titled their lead editorial, California's ethnic studies curriculum is controversial and a little sloppy, but much improved. And I'll just capture the essence of that editorial. Now in its third draft, the ethnic studies curriculum has been stripped of its narrow ideological bias, its divisive victimization narratives, and even its impenetrable academic jargon. For all of these improvements, however, this new version isn't ready to ship out, which is a shame. The article, the editorial continues. The State Board of, a of Education may have to seek another extension from the legislature in order to get this right. Fast forward to today, this morning's New York Times, Brett Stevens editorial titled, California's Ethnic Studies Follies. I'll capture the essence of Brett Stevens' views. Public education is supposed to create a sense of common citizenship while cultivating the habits of independent thinking. This is a curriculum that magnifies differences, encourages tribal loyalties, and advances ideological group think. So we have the LA Times, the New York Times. If this were to be a report card, putting it in the parlance of a grade, one could argue that this should be an incomplete. So to each of you, and I'll begin, if I may, with uh, Dr. Friedman. Given the cautionary tone struck by the Times, specifically, what is your view of the suggestion that the CDE seek another extension in order to get this right? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me to join you, my friends uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, I love Los Angeles and I'm speaking to you from San Francisco, but we all share a concern for our state. And uh, we all have a lot to think about with regard to this particular issue. The uh, LA Times actually was not quite accurate because I think uh, a number of the issues that they raised and a lot of the citations that they mentioned were not necessarily from the current version of the uh, ethnic studies curriculum, which is a little bit unfortunate because it's not quite uh, uh, correct. There have been a lot of changes made to the curriculum. It's not uh, what everyone would want. It's been a very tumultuous, very painful process for many people because it brings up all the issues about our stories, our history, relations between various groups. Uh, it's just deeply, deeply emotional, uh, as well as uh, in, in reality, quite a conflict about how do we tell our story? How do we bring everyone together in, in, in the common citizenship while recognizing that everyone uh, has a different story? So. I think the uh, curriculum that we now see is actually a much uh, more acceptable version. There are still changes that need to be made. And now it's up to the state board. They are mandated by the legislature to uh, approve an ethnic studies curriculum at their board meeting, the State Board of Education. Uh, I know that they're still considering final changes. They're reviewing this, but it is uh, now up to the State Board of Education to approve the final version. Thank you, Senator Elect Kamala Gordo. Uh, your your take on the on, on the on the Times editorial. Um, 
I don't want to quite say eviscerating, but um, certainly very sobering. Uh, the New York Times, I'm sorry, um, not the LA Times. You know, it's, I want to just echo, I want to echo some of the comments that uh, Ms. Friedman just shared. History is a very personal thing. Um, and yet we use it not just to tell stories, but also to build bridges um, and to share differences, to share similarities, and also to kind of reveal our humanity in our stories. Um, and I think it is incredibly challenging to ask other people to write that history, especially when um, we've gone through a summer and even a year um, where folks have walked out into the streets protesting about wanting to be liberated enough to share their own story in their own way. Um, I think that this iteration shows progress. I actually had a number of um, discussions with some of my colleagues in the Jewish caucus about all of this that has been going on um, and the relief that they shared uh, with um, how some changes have been made um, and the consternation um, that they felt uh, throughout the Jewish community at the very beginning of this. I get concerned when we ask for extensions and have delays after delays after delays. I don't think you can get anything right uh, when it comes to the history of peoples discussing racism and biases and conflict. Um, and so I'm hoping that you know, we'll still be able to come to a place where maybe everyone is equally unhappy. Generally, that means something good has actually transpired. But to kind of see this as a living, breathing, fluid document, um, documenting our history. But I think not only is it trying to get our arms around the kind of curriculum that will be taught, but also who teaches it and who they're teaching it to and the tools that we are giving to those educators um, so that they're able to teach this kind of curriculum in a way that is neutral and informing. Thank you for that. And we're gonna, we're gonna come back to the, uh, those next steps in that implementation phase. That will be part of, our, part of our conversation. So a little bit of foreshadowing there. Uh, Nick, your thoughts on, on uh, you know, the Times, which has, this wasn't their first editorial uh, comment. They've, they've been watching and, um, and this is where they came out on Sunday. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. You know, a little sloppy, but much improved. I mean, to me, that's most of public policy making. I mean, nothing that comes from Senator-elect Kamala Gurdjieff, of course. But you know, I want to. I, I, I'm just reminded of a story right before the pandemic, because it was in person. I was speaking at uh, the Village Nation Summit, which is a, a a group that works with our Black families, in particularly uh, in particular, um, to talk about empowerment. And I, a gentleman named Fluke Fluker is the founder of that. Uh, organization. And I asked him what inspired him to start it. And he said he was a teacher who was also coaching basketball at a local community college. And when he was leaving the school one day to go to his second job, he ran into one of his students who was skipping down, uh, skipping down the parking lot. And he said, where are you going, Mr. Fluker? And the teacher said, to my second job. And the student said, well, that's funny because I'm going to my second school. Mr. Fluker confused, said, what do you mean your second school? And the student said, I'm going to Hebrew school. And Mr. Fluker said, what do you learn at Hebrew school? And this kid said, oh, nothing much, just how great my people are. And, you know, I think about that, not only through the lens of my own Hebrew school experience, but, you know, he was inspired to start this Village Nation project because every kid should know how great their people are. And I think this is the promise of ethnic studies. Now, when I was going to school, um, you know, I felt that I had a history teacher or a few who were able to infuse ethnic studies through the core curriculum. And so, you know, I think LA Unified, and I'm sure we'll get into this in a minute, has our own curriculum, um, you know, that I think has been more appreciated and lauded. And I think rather than having a state model LA Unified, maybe it should have been the inverse. But I will say my fear with any curricula is that it, it makes this more reductionist than it should be. 
I don't want our students, and we're very cognizant about this in LA Unified, to check off a box and say, oh, I've done ethnic studies. When, when I was a middle school teacher, I made sure that not only did we read Shakespeare and Harper Lee and Faulkner, but that we also read the authors, James Baldwin and Sandra Cisneros, and authors who uh, better reflected the experiences of my students. And so I think, you know, long-winded way of saying, I think this is an improvement. I agree what we're hearing from advocates is that it's much improved. But again, I, I don't want us to be, you know, lose sight of the broader project that could be involved here, which is just making sure every student um, knows their history. And this can be, you know, the sum is greater than the uh, whole, of its, uh, whole of its parts here if we do this right. And that's been the biggest um, disappointment over the last few years. And I'd like to think we're turning a corner. Thank you for that. I, I wanna um, go a little deeper on Senator Leck's question uh, and, and comment about, uh, about next steps and implementation, but to ask, there are so many groups and stakeholders who have uh, contributed to this, to this process that has evolved over the better part of, uh, of two years now. How do you view the curriculum and its implementation phase as a tool for building bridges and, and, and generating uh, greater empathy among diverse constituencies and audiences and students ultimately who will be the beneficiaries of, of, uh, of the learning? Are you, who are you asking? I'm sorry, I was asking you, uh, Sydney. Oh, oh, oh. Um, so, you know, I'm always amazed at, um, you know, with each generation, it, it seems like we lose a little bit of history. And so maybe this is kind of, you know, the juggernaut that we need to help folks, um, you know, understand what happened 15 or 20 years, you know, let alone 30 or 45 or 70 years before they were born. And maybe that's just me feeling kind of old with all of these Gen Zs. Um, but I think this is an incredible opportunity that we have, especially, um, you know, given that I'm from Los Angeles, which is incredibly diverse, to be able to help young folks understand um, the history and the legacies of different ethnicities and how we have worked together. How we have worked together um, to overcome, you know, civil rights injustices, how we have worked together to elevate um, someone else's pain um, or someone else's shame um, in order to get to somewhere that is better and brighter. I think, you know, we have come through about four years of divisiveness and polarization, and especially last year, actually increased disconnectedness, where everyone has sort of gone in their own corners to fight for their own future. Um, and I have learned through organizing and, and through uh, community building and coalition building of my own that that doesn't yield the kind of dividends that you want if you're fighting for a greater kind of justice. So I am hopeful that as uncomfortable as um, this experience has been around this curriculum, that it, it has also re-energized the need for folks to come together. You know, this year in the legislature, we well, we have a number of ethnic caucuses and identity caucuses. And this year we actually formed a diversity caucus where we have representatives from each of the different caucuses coming together to figure out how we can work together more fluidly, where there are opportunities for us to participate in you know, educational sessions so that we can learn more deeply about some of the challenges that some of the other caucuses are having to face. Two weeks ago, we had um, during floor session, you know, the API caucus talking about the increase in the Asian American hate crimes. You know, last year we spent a lot of time talking about the uptick in anti-Semitism, but we cannot just share those stories and fears with like-minded you know, communities, we have to step outside and help folks understand, you know, that your pain or your suffering is going to impact me. Um, so I'm hopeful that this rather tense, um, you know, and uncomfortable experience can yield in that way. Thank you for that. And you've certainly lived through the, uh, the evolution of this process and it, and it continues to be an evolutionary process. I wanna turn a question, uh, uh, back to Anita, uh, 
you have had the opportunity to serve as a commissioner on the IQC, the Instructional Quality Commission, which is uh, in many respects, respects sort of that, as I understand it, the sort of initial intake and, and filter for refining and receiving many of the public comments as, as, the, as the curriculum has, has seen its different iterations from the inside and looking at, at, at process and how this has evolved in the moment, uh, the precipice on which we stand looking at the potential of, a, of a consideration by the Board of Education next week, next Thursday, what have you gleaned from, from being on the inside that perhaps uh, can enlighten and inform the audience, the rest of us, uh, most of us who have been on the outside looking in until now? Uh, thank you for that question. I'm glad to share my views and my experiences because I think it would be helpful for people to understand what the process was. I, uh, I got involved because uh, I was appointed by the State Senate to fill a seat on the 18 member uh, Instructional Quality Commission, which has existed for a long time in the state of California to oversee curriculum for all of the 6 million children in California public schools and to advise the State Board of Education. Uh, I, I was involved uh, and I got involved because I was very concerned as were many of us about the first and second and uh, uh, iterations of this ethnic studies curriculum. I felt that it was, to me, it was a form of state-sponsored anti-Semitism. It was also discriminatory towards many other groups, not just members of the Jewish community. And I felt that it needed to be changed and that uh, hopefully I could contribute. Uh, overall, I think in this country, and I think we all know this, we have long since passed the point when we could hope to be a community, even a Jewish community, or a society without divisions. We are very different. We have different views, different stories, different priorities, different issues. But I believe, uh, and I've seen in action at the uh, Instructional Quality Commission State Board of Education and, and from the leadership of the state, including the governor, who really uh, set the, the tone for what a uh, culturally competent ethnic studies curriculum should be. I believe that uh, what binds us together, uh, even with all our differences, runs very deep and very strong, and we can't lose sight of that. The Instructional Quality Commission, there's a lot of differences among those 18 people, but I think everyone ultimately believed that and was focused on creating a what I would describe as a culturally competent classroom. Let's start from the point of view of the student. Culturally competent classroom is one where every child knows both the triumphs and the tragedies of their story, their family story, where the uh, classroom reduces stigmatization and, uh, and eliminates stereotypes and then stitches everyone together so that all the children understand that there is something that's very deep and very strong that binds us together as a mosaic in this state and is, in, and, uh, and is uh, members of this uh, great country. That was the goal of the Instructional Quality Commission. And I think that we, we ultimately reached um, uh, largely uh, unanimous recommendation of the improved, profoundly improved ethnic studies curriculum and made that recommendation to the State Board of Education. Now, there are still many issues. Many different groups have different concerns about it. Many people have concerns about the whole concept of ethnic studies, but that train has left the station. We are going to have an ethnic studies curriculum that's designed to create a culturally competent classroom where every child knows their story, but they also understand what they have in common. That ought to strengthen a country that is really devouring itself through conflict. I have felt that the leadership on the state level, um, at every level in the California Department of Education, the Inter Instructional Quality Commission, the State Board of Education, the governor's office have that shared goal. So I am not sure where we're gonna ultimately end up because the state board has to make some final decisions, but um, I think we are headed in a much better direction and that will be okay. I don't think that's where the big fight is gonna be though. That's not where the struggle is gonna be. The struggle is now gonna move to every school board in the state of California who has the right 
and the responsibility uh, to develop its own curriculum. And they're not necessarily gonna accept what the state puts forward as a model curriculum. LA has its own, right? You're not looking to, to Sacramento to tell you what your, your children should learn. Other counties have the same thing. So we um, had a wake up call as a Jewish community when we saw what happened in Sacramento. And we have to understand that this is just the beginning of an ongoing issue that's gonna take place in most school boards in the state of California. So that's um, my summary from my point of view as an insider. Um, I'm quite hopeful. It's been a good experience. I think we've moved in the right direction. But um, if anybody thinks that this is over um, next uh, March 18th, um, they don't fully understand what the issues are that we're facing. Thank you very much, Anita. And I want to uh, go back to Nick for a moment. Knowing that LA Unified has, uh, for a few years now, been incrementally implementing its own version of an ethnic studies curriculum and doing it intentionally, incrementally, as I understand it, in order to evaluate and, and tweak and, and ultimately uh, improve the experience uh, for students in the district. Give us that little glimpse, if you will, into the crystal ball. When we, when we really get to the, you know, where the, where the rubber hits the road, the implementation phase, the teacher training phase, what um, can you tell us from the LA Unified experience that can help to inform what may come from the state and what we may see uh, throughout California? Yeah, and I, um, you know, I was gratified that, as I'm sure many folks who are participating in tonight's webinar read that article a few weeks ago in the Torch about, um, you know, is California erasing Jews from history? Uh, maybe a little incendiary headline, but uh, that there was a quote, um, you know, from an advocate around about LA Unified's curriculum and said, you know, why, why start from scratch? Why not look at LA? And I, I think. I will just say as a note of caution before lauding some of the stuff that we've done, that Anita is absolutely right. And we already have some advocates uh, for certain perspectives. Many of those that we saw in the first iteration of the uh, model curriculum who are already coming to working groups and trying to you know, infiltrate um, is maybe a little uh, conspiratorial, but coming to uh, LA. And so I think we, you know, as the, as the, um, uh, forum moves in the coming months, um, you know, I do think we need to keep our guard up. You know, I think that we, again, and it, it's, it goes a little bit to what I was saying earlier, because when, in 2008, when I started teaching in LA Unified, I participated in culturally responsive pedagogies. And as Anita was saying, how do we make sure that our, our pedagogy is culturally competent and we're meeting the needs of our students? And as the ethnic studies um, movement grew, we started working with our students, with our teachers, with our partners, uh, about developing uh, curriculum. And it started, and my colleagues on the panel have alluded to this already, but it started from what connects us in our shared histories um, rather than what divides us in our shared struggles. And I think that's been you know, one of the lessons that, that we've seen in LA is that when you start about how do you, um, even something that has been as, um, uh, divisive, I guess, is the idea of victimization. How do you talk about victimhood and history and genocide and as opposed to who had it worse or who had it more recently or, and, and so I think the curriculum is, you know, is built on these, these historically marginalized and underappreciated and studied groups, but in a way that builds connection. And a lot of that, and, and this is where I know Anita and others efforts will be um, focused in the coming months and years is on teacher training. And I will say that one of the, the first thing, uh, things I got involved with when I joined the board, um, or I guess first controversies I waded into is that a, a course for our educators, um, you know, educators do a lot of professional development, they can get salary points. And a course that was on how to teach the Middle East had been infiltrated with a BDS, um, very anti-Israel uh, curriculum. And so what had been approved by a joint committee of the teachers union and the school district uh, to teach teachers had evolved slowly into something that um, was unacceptable. And so we were quickly able to pull that course and reevaluate. But to me, it started thinking of, you know, about the need for inclusive teacher training um, and how do we, you know, because we're talking about a, a generation of teachers that maybe didn't have their own ethnic studies or culturally competent classes themselves. Um, and so that's where a lot of this effort has to be in is, is the training the trainers. But I think, you know, to Anita's point, 
we um, we'll, we are we've been watching the the state model curriculum. We've been advocating uh, for the changes that that we've started to see. But we also are working on refining and using our local curriculum that's been developed by local advocates, local educators. Um, and we passed a resolution uh, just a few months ago to ensure that in the next few years every student has access um, to a ethnic studies course and eventually um, phase in the graduation requirement even before. The state, um, uh, the state requirement will take effect. Thank you for that. We've uh, been receiving some uh, very thought-provoking questions from, from the audience, and I want to try to uh, synthesize one of them. And it, it goes back a little bit to, um, to Anita's comments a, moment, a few moments ago about uh, the school board, uh, grassroots level, really where, again, that the, the rubber hits the road. And, and, and to sort of try to pose the question in the context of this latest version of the curriculum has come uh, such a distance from the initial draft that those who were the, 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 the authors, if you, were, if you will, the, the co-signatories to the original draft have made very clear publicly that they want nothing to do with this latest version. And that, um, you know, before any, any you know, victory is declared, uh, none of that inoculates Californians and our respective school boards from further mischief making, that's my term, that to, to try to encourage school boards to uh, revert back to that initial draft. How can, our audience, how can the Jewish community, how can people who care about quality public education in California ensure that um, school boards are able to uh, fulfill their duties and, and be uh, true to the approved ultimate edition, ultimately approved edition of, uh, of the curriculum. So it's a little bit of a, you know, these folks aren't just you know, fading off into the sunset. Uh, they're not happy. They will continue to surface. And at the same time, we want to advocate for uh, what ultimately has, is a better product. Uh, how do we reconcile that? How do we, how do we ensure quality control uh, at all levels is really the question. You want to perhaps start Anita and then this is really to everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I said, I think uh, the situation that we face with ethnic studies and its impact on the Jewish community and the anti-Semitism that was reflected in it uh, was a wake-up call for the organized Jewish community. Uh, most of the people in the Jewish community who are politically active really haven't paid all that much attention to what's happening in Sacramento and actually not all that much attention to what's happening on the local level with school boards. I mean, I, I, I really admire uh, LA Unified because you have really led the way and you have become a, 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 an example that was oftentimes uh, referenced uh, in, in the uh, deliberations of the IQC and in these discussions uh, on the state level. But um, we have to organize ourselves differently. I will say that uh, the, the Jewish community deserves also a lot of credit. I mean, other communities were also um, under attack, they felt unrecognized, they felt uh, discriminated against, um, and they also weighed in, oftentimes in cooperation with the Jewish community, as that was actually a great uh, inspiration in terms of democracy in, in action. This is how democracy works. You are supposed to petition your elected officials on behalf of a cause in which you believe to educate them on issues of common concern. That is our job. And that is our job as citizens, is to do that. I think uh, the... Um, the Jewish community is going to learn a lot of lessons from this experience. Um, I, I have uh, to many people described this from my point of view as a near death experience for the Jewish community, because uh, this was a very, very difficult um, curriculum for the Jewish community to face and to, and to see that this was actually being taken seriously on the state level. We have fixed that. All the different organizations in the Jewish community, and there are many, uh, many of them I'm sure are on this call, uh, uh, AJC and the synagogues and so many other organizations actually came together 
to work this out and to try to find unity. It's not so simple to find unity within the Jewish community, as some of you may be aware. But actually, we kind of found our way. We found our way also in coalition with other groups. Now we have to have um, a, a very strong voice in, in Sacramento in a way that we haven't before. And I think with the Jewish caucus uh, and the leadership of the Jewish caucus, we're on our way. We have a statewide organization that represents us. We have many organizations who are deeply involved and we have to be involved on the local level, have to be involved in the school board level, pay attention to what's happening, have relationships, organize, because this is going to become a, an issue on the local level and uh, it's reflecting a trend that's happening throughout the entire country. So uh, this is truly a, a time when we have to rise to the occasion. Thank you. And uh, Senator-elect uh, Kamala Goudeau, uh, your sense of how we preserve the integrity of, of um, what ultimately is approved. So, you know, uh, I think as I stated earlier, I see this as the beginning and not the end. Um, and there will probably be, as there should be, um, a series of continued, you know, discussions and opportunities for reflection, um, you know, as we move towards something that will never be fully comprehensive, um, but hopefully is um, evolving uh, in terms of how we are telling history. And then once again, who is telling it? Um, how it is being taught, how it is being learned, you know, how it is being told. As I was listening to your question and as I was listening to Ms. Friedman, I was actually thinking about one of my travels to Israel. I had dinner one night um, with a gentleman who was a peace negotiator. Um, and over the course of dinner, of course, sharing lots of really insightful stories. And I asked, you know, a very, I think, pedestrian question, right? Do you ever think there will be peace in the Middle East? And he said, no, not until each party acknowledges the other's trauma. And that has stuck with me for a very long time. And this is part of what we're going through with this ethnic studies curriculum. It has bubbled back up to the surface, um, you know, people's trauma about how their history has been told for them without their involvement around how folks have been shamed, marginalized, um, you know, how they've had power either denied or taken from them. And we've become very hypersensitive about, you know, our, our need to be liberated from someone else's hold on our history and how it is shared. You're not gonna, that is never gonna be resolved with public policy. That gets resolved when people are willing to sort of bear truths um, that sometimes are, are, are um, distasteful or uh, hard um, to figure out what the understanding is. I mean, ultimately it's not just like, you know, do you want this child to learn about how, you know, about this particular war or, you know, or this particular event, hopefully also, it's also about helping young folks understand who they are and who they are in relationship to all of these other groups that make up this ecosystem called the planet or Los Angeles or wherever you're from. And that cannot happen and nor should it happen through public policy. It's nitty gritty, dirty, um, evolving. Um, and it also requires us to have a very, to take a very hard look about the biases that are in our school districts. You know, how things, who are these folks who are teaching our kids and what biases do they bring to the table as it relates to the Jewish community? Do they know that it's not a monolithic community? Do they know all of the different groups that make up the Jewish community and the relationships that they all have? Is that something they should know? What's the best way to teach them that? What's the way that we want them to teach the young people? Are there parts of the history that we don't want non-Jewish people to know? I don't know that all of that is going to be able to be shared in this kind of curriculum. And I don't even know if it should be, but I think those are very important questions that we should continue to elevate and hopefully dissect 
because I think those are the kinds of questions and these are the kinds of discussions that you have to have if you want to have a better, deeper, evolving relationship with a friend who is Jewish or with the Jewish community as a whole. Thank you. And Nick, thoughts on um, preserving the, the best of, uh, of the intent of-, of Yes, of the, quality, the quality control. You know, in, in a few weeks we'll be, um, as a, as a people telling a story um, about how folks have been trying to erase Jews from history for, for millennia. So I'm not naive enough to think that this, you know, is the last stand. Um, I would say, you know, echoing my colleagues, I mean, folks do have to get involved locally. We have to vote. I'm sure even some participants in this call, maybe this, as Anita was saying, have opened up our eyes to what's happening locally. But a, I know a lot of my peer group, you know, mid thirties, they can talk very fluently about national politics, but they don't know who their school board member is, their city council um, man or woman, their senator uh, elect or their assembly member. And these are the people who are making decisions about how, what we teach our kids, how we teach our kids, housing policy. And so I really do encourage folks to get involved locally. Um, you know, you can, as Ani was saying, and please do petition your elected officials. There are different ways to petition. And I know Sydney and I would have asked that you do it in a, um, you know, nice email never hurts. But, um, you know, on issues that are important to various communities, we do get a lot of advocacy. That's part of what this is all about. Um, so we need to keep our guard up. I also think that we need to build coalitions around this and other issues. You know, the late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs has said that anti-Semitism is the world's most reliable early warning sign of other forms and threats to freedom, humanity, and what he called the dignity of difference. And I think that it's that dignity of difference that especially the last few years we have really um, uh, lost sight of. And so I think that, you know, if one is we should, and, and this goes to the, the um, polyglot of a community that, that advocated in this issue, but I would love to hear from not only Jewish constituents about ethnic studies, but all my constituents. And similarly, it goes both ways. And I think the Jewish community, as we typically do, but building bridges um, and making sure we're there for, you know, and advocating for other communities and also understanding why many communities feel like ethnic studies is long overdue and that any attempt to delay is uh, further marginalizing their community. And I think we have to seek first to understand and, and work together. But you know, what really drew me to a career in public service and, and civil rights is that image of Jack Greenberg sitting with Thurgood Marshall litigating all the desegregation cases. And I think um, you know, that those coalitions uh, still exist. I mean, I will, you know, Senator elect and I are close friends and colleagues. Um, and I would you know, put her up the top of the list of al allies and advocates for the Jewish community. I'd like to think that I would do the same for other, you know, that, that I can be an ally and friend as well. And so this coalition building is key because then we won't only have to be vigilant when these bouts of anti-Semitism creep in, but we'll have friends and allies who will also stand up on our behalf. Thank you all. I, I wanna ask also from the audience a, a very practical question. There are, so many demands placed upon uh, teachers and ultimately students during the, the course of a school day, I'm thinking pre-pandemic school day, not even what it, it will look like as we go forward. How does uh, an ethnic studies curriculum with all that it involves fit? Does it become an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary um, tool or resource. Ultimately, how does this get inserted into the school day in a way that is meaningful and complementary to all else that constitutes the, the core requirements right. of a high school curriculum? And I'll, let me start. Uh, let me let me stick with you for a minute, Nick, and then uh, and then we'll we'll go forward. Yeah. This is such an important question. And I think, you know, besides the controversy we've been discussing, one of my major questions with ethnic studies, because you know, I'd also like, we've been trying to make, you know, coding a graduation requirement and building a lot of other things into what is already a, a packed school day. And so that's where, you know, where, where I began my remarks tonight, which is about the interdisciplinary nature of this. Um, I think we're gonna have this, this liminal period where you have your AP US history class and then you have an ethnic studies class. But it is really my hope in LA Unified and throughout the state that 
those merge and that your history class is also one that, that uh, speaks for all people. I think again, back in 2002 uh, to my AP US history teacher who had a textbook, but also had Howard Zinn's People Hist uh, People's History of the United States. And every, you know, and so, and I felt like when I left that class, I understood the dominant narrative of American history. I also thought I heard a lot of, you know, history as told by the, the losers, if you will. Um, and it all, it didn't, contrary to what we hear a lot right now, it didn't make me hate America. It made me really appreciate the nuance, nuance that is this country. Um, and uh, I think it, a lot of it starts with humility. So I think, in, you know, we are, in LA Unified, we're thinking about making a course available first so that students can take it as an elective. Um, and then thinking about how to build it in as a graduation requirement. But I would really like to see us um, weave the tapestry that is ethnic studies in not just our history class, but our English class, our social studies class, foreign language. Um, one, because I think that's where it belongs, but two, because it solves this very practical problem of just how do you pack more into an already jam packed day. Thank you. And uh, Anita, your thoughts on where it all fits? Uh, well, it's not mandated yet as a requirement for, for a graduation. Uh, and uh, to the governor's credit, he uh, vetoed because he said, I don't know what that curriculum looks like yet. I'm not gonna mandate it until I know that it's inclusive of all California's children, tells all their stories and does create culturally competent classrooms that bring children together. Uh, I think he's gonna wait to see um, uh, what this looks like. If, if it's a culturally competent uh, uh, curriculum that we all could feel proud of, we can all live with, then I think uh, there will be a bill in the legislature that will mandate it and hopefully the governor will sign it. But the bottom line is, uh, and I think Nick mentioned this too, the landscape is littered with uh, requirements of public school teachers. Uh, but my experience, and, and I, I've involved in teaching with my staff in, in hundreds and hundreds of schools to tens of thousands of uh, public school students every year on Holocaust education and patterns of genocide. And when you provide excellent training and support for the teachers, they love it. They want it, it makes it heroes. They make them heroes in the classroom, the children love it and they seek it out. So I think um, if in fact the State Board of Education does approve a curriculum that we feel we can live with and if it's a mandated and approved and becomes a requirement, then we are going to have to get involved in the local schools, provide support, teach the teachers, help them to create really wonderful experiences that are really uplifting for their students and then they will want it and they will seek it out and actually the result will be great for the state of California. And of course, what's happening in California is being watched by the whole country. This is going to become part of the fabric of how we live our lives in this country, which is why all of us have been so concerned and all of our organizations, Jewish and non-Jewish, have so been so concerned with getting it right. Thank you for that. This is absolutely uh, blowing eastward and the world is watching California. Senator-elect, uh, your thoughts on, 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 uh, on this part, how, how it all fits. Yeah, um, so I, a couple of years ago, I uh, did two bills on implicit bias training, mandating it for medical community, the medical community, doctors, nurses, physicians, assistants, and then for um, uh, one for, um, members of the bench, as well as lawyers um, and bailiffs, folks who worked in the courts. And during the course of getting those bills passed, we talked to a lot of experts in the field around implicit bias. And they said that uh, these kinds of trainings were more successful when they were integrated into training sessions that were already in place. But when you sort of relegated this particular issue like implicit bias, you know, uh, to its own space, um, you didn't really find a lot of success. And there are other examples about when folks have gone on to have, you know, um, ethics training or, you know, harassment training. Um, as a standalone, uh, psychologically, people review it and see it as something um, less important, but rather and more like a, a box that you have to check off. That's how I see ethnic studies. You know, I think we should be integrating it Know, into how we're teaching math, how we're teaching science, how we're teaching history, um, rather than saying, okay, now we're going to dedicate 45 minutes or however long to talking about ethnicity, 
Um, because I think that sort of creates a space in folks' mind like, oh, okay, now I have to do this. They think that this is important. And it is, but I think it becomes more important when it's infused in how you're learning, you know, arithmetic um, and, and learning who folks were who helped sort of, you know, invent certain things that have made it easier for us to do what we're doing or have created the kind of life that we're able to live. So I am hoping that we can move to that space because that that is really, I think, what ethnic studies should be about, right? All of the different folks that have um, gone through this life and have either done something or created something or fought for something as it relates to what it is that the child is learning in that particular class. That informs history, legacy, empowerment, um, et cetera. So I think we have to move beyond compartmentalizing because I also don't think that's how children learn. Right. Thank you. We, uh, we have sort of reached that, that magic moment uh, of the, the Zoom, uh, Zoom 60th minute. And I, we, we want um, to thank uh, all of you, each of you for, for your insights, for your passion, for your dedication, for your commitment, and your openness to continuing to walk this journey uh, together to Senator elect Sidney Kamlager Dove, to Nick Melvoin, to Anita Friedman, on behalf of Stephen Wise Temple, on behalf of the American Jewish Committee, and a grateful audience and community. We, uh, we are inspired by your words, and I think we will take to heart we've got to vote with our feet, we've got to get involved, we've got to roll up our sleeves. We've got to be plugged in. And uh, I hope in our audience tonight, somebody's going to run for school board in their community yeah. or run perhaps for uh, unless, Rick, or for, for, for a newly vacant uh, assembly yeah, seat. And, yeah, unless your community is the west side of LA or the West Valley, please uh -huh. run for school board. Got it, LA. got it. Thank yeah. you. But, uh, thank I, you again for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to serve with all of you on this panel. And um, I'll just share with you what uh, a wise person once told me. He said, um, when I was complaining about how things are, he said, you know what, Anita, if you don't like the news then go out and make some of your own. So that's, that's our, uh, our mandate. That's beautiful. Um, thank you, Rabbi Yoshi. Thank you, Rabbi Ron. And uh, to, to our wise family, uh, wise indeed. Uh, thank you all, Godspeed. And um, let's go make some news. Good night. Good night.